Hello and welcome to the show. I am your host Neil Taylor and this is a short history of. This time we are taking a look at an Atari console. I'm going to play you an, an actual advert for it in a moment and I'll give you the history of it. Thank you very much for taking the time to watch this video and please remember if you like the video, like it, dislike it, if you dislike it and leave me a comment down below and if you haven't done so already, please subscribe to the channel. So before I give you the history of, I warn you now, this advert is one of the most 80s things I've seen in a long time. So hopefully you enjoy that and then we'll get the history of the Atari 5200. Vanguard sent the beat, Galaxian. Now where you been? You'll make the days roll on by. Blasting bombs out of the sky. Well, you know deep down that it's gonna be a hummer. Cause nobody's hotter than Atari this summer. Nobody's hotter than this summer, the really hot video games come from Atari. We've got Centipede, Ms. Pac-Man, Vanguard, and Galaxian. If you thought it was going to be just another summer, Atari is going to turn your head around. The hot names, the hot games, the hot deals. Yeah, it's gonna be a hummer, cause nobody's hotter than Atari this summer. Nobody's hotter than Atari. So it's time to take a look at Atari's follow-up to the popular Atari 2600. And if you're interested, you can check out the video by clicking on the icon on the top screen and you can see my short history of the Atari 2600. But this time, no, we're here to talk about the 5200. First off, I love the, the name that Atari gave it. It's the Atari 5200 Super System. Now that is a console name. The 5200 was introduced in North America in November 1982. Atari had intended the 5200 to compete with Mattel's Intellivision, but it ended up competing more with the ColecoVision instead. Remember that we're still in the second generation, so there's no Nintendo yet, and the games crash is about to happen as well, so yeah. Now, the hardware inside the 5200 is pretty much identical to Atari's 8-bit computers. While the hardware is the same though, the software is different and isn't compatible between the two, and possibly a missed opportunity. A lot of tech in the Atari 8-bit computers was originally developed as a second-gen console with the intention of replacing the 2600, but when the system was almost finished, the personal computer revolution hit. With the likes of the Commodore PET, the TRS-80 and the Apple II, Atari's hardware was more advanced than the machines that were out, however, the competition's hardware sold for a higher price, with higher profit margins, so Atari's management had a difficult decision to make. Stay in the console market? And at this time, you have to remember that a lot of the home consoles were seen as toys and nothing more. Or should they move over to the home computer market, the PC market, which was seen as the next big thing? So, of course, Atari went with the home computer market. I mean, it only makes sense. There was money to be made there. What they did was they repackaged the new tech into the Atari 400 and 800. Now, and yes, at some point, I will cover those on the show. Later, Atari would decide to re-enter the console market, the idea being to use a design that matched their original 1978 specs. Now, the initial release of the 5200 had four controller ports, which was unusual at the time, seeing as most systems only had two. For the 5200, they designed a new style of controller that had an analog joystick, non-centering, and this would be an issue, a numeric keypad with two fire buttons on each side of the controller, as well as keys for start, pause, and reset. Now, uh, a little side note, this controller was ranked the 10th worst game controller of all time by IGN, and Next Generation said that the non-centering joystick rendered many games almost unplayable. To be honest, Atari outside of the 2600, and if you look at that controller, that is an iconic controller, never seemed to crack the idea of controllers at all. Need convincing of this? Take a look at the Jaguar controller. Yeah, no, they, they, they for some reason they never really got it, and I think it's in one of the follow-ups they did, they basically copied the Atari 26, so 2600's controller, so yeah, they, it seems to be something that design-wise Atari never seemed to get their heads around. And yes, the Jaguar will also have its time on this channel as well, but let's get back to the 5200. Now, one of the innovations that the 5200 had, originally it kind of gets phased out unfortunately, was the automatic TV switching box. Now this is an RF box that would automatically switch from the TV to the game when the system was turned on. 
Oddly though, the RF box was also where the power supply was connected in a unique dual power television signal setup, which was similar to RCA's Studio 2 machine. Some of the things we take for granted were like channels switching automatically was in this, but they phased it out. But yeah, very weird that you'd connect your power to the um, to the TV signal box as well. Atari would revise the 52 hardware in 1983, and it's the revision of the 5200 that had two controller ports instead of the four, and its power supply changed to a more conventional separate power supply, as well as a standard non-auto switching RF switch. There was also changes made in the cartridge port address line to allow for a Atari 2600 adapter that would be released later in the year. Now, the 5200 did not fare well commercially compared to the 2600. It may have had superior graphics to the 2600 and to Mattel's Intellivision, but the 5200 was initially incompatible with the expansive library of the 2600, with some market analysts speculating that that may have impacted sales. Yes, even back in 1982, backwards compatibility was an issue. Atari chose Super Breakout as the packing title for the 5200, and it's an odd choice because this did not make use of the 5200's improved graphics. Many of the 5200's games appeared simply as updated versions of 2600 titles, which failed to excite consumers. The lack of new games was partly due to a lack of funding as Atari had continued to develop most of its games for the oversaturated market of the 2600. This would be like Nintendo releasing the SNES, but keeping the NES as its main focus of development, if you want some sort of comparison. During a press conference in May 1984, Atari announced the 7800, they also revealed that the 5200 had been discontinued after only two years on the market. Atari reported that the 5200 had sold in excess of 1 million units. Now, compare that to the amount of 2600 sold, that is a very low number. Now, I couldn't actually find numbers that correlate to that time. The overall sales of the 2600 is apparently 30 million, so that's quite a lot. But I don't think that's quite in keeping with our time scale. So, even worse though, is the Intellivision would sell over 3 million units and the ColecoVision would sell over 2 million units. At first glance, it would be fair to say that the 5200's failures come down to some poor choices of hardware, for the controller for example, which is an ugly and horrible controller, and the lack of support from Atari themselves, who did not want to seem to let go of the 2600. Also bear in mind, this console released at the same time as the 1983 video crash or the Atari Shock. I love that name, I love that. At some point I will work out how to do a video on that. There's a lot of books and videos out there that you can go and watch or read to, to find out more information. I obviously like to do these videos. It's just sort of a cliff notes, a little sampler so people might get interested and go off and look at other things and I highly recommend that you do. If you do have any recommendations for books to read on Atari or the video game crash of 1983, Please pop them down in the comments down below. Hopefully you have enjoyed this uh, video. Uh, hopefully you've enjoyed hearing the history of the 5200. Like I said, I tend to do these videos as a sampler. There's plenty more places you can go to get much more in-depth information if you're so interested. Once again, thank you very much for watching the video. Like the video if you liked it. Dislike the video if you dislike it. Leave me a comment down below, especially if you have recommendations for books, audiobooks or whatever, or other videos to check out on Atari. Thank you very much, and I will see you next time.